thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, as, as Bill mentioned, I am the director of the Georgia Transportation Institute um, at Georgia Tech. Uh, but my, my role has been much, has been very varied. I mean, I have had a state DOT experience. Uh, I have participated on many different national commissions as well as state commissions. So, so my perspective on transportation and the role of IT and the relationship with sustainability and transportation, I think, uh, is informed from a variety of perspectives. And so I want to talk to you this morning about transportation systems and information technology. And I said it's pushing the boundaries of sustainable outcomes. Now, one of the things about transportation uh, that's very important, as most infrastructure, is especially if you're looking into the future, is you have to ask yourself the question, what are some of the trends, some of the factors that in the future are likely going to affect your particular interest, in my case, transportation? Um, and so my talk is going to talk start very broadly in terms of the future. It's then going to talk a little bit about, well, how do we as transportation people look at sustainability and sustainable options, and then very specifically in terms of some, uh, some possible research directions. Uh, I was asked a couple years ago by the Regional Plan Association of New York to talk about what are some of those key factors that are going to affect the uh, performance of the transportation system in the future. Um, and I came up with this. Uh, certainly the growth in population and the distribution of that population uh, in the nation as well as in the world is going to be very important. Uh, we are, <coughs> excuse me, we are a growing nation, uh, unlike other nations in the world, uh, and that's going to put increasing demand on our transportation systems. We are not building new transportation systems, so basically what we have now is what we're going to have incrementally in the future. That means we have to better manage those systems primarily, and that is a key challenge to transportation, and that's gonna, I'm going to come back to that theme uh, later on. The demographics are changing. I hate to tell you this, but as you sit there, you're all getting older. Um, and the society is getting older, the population is getting older, and I have some data a little bit later on I think that may be shocking to you. But as we get older, we may be relying more and more on information and information technologies with regard to trying to accomplish many of the things that we do. Obviously, in terms of uh, minority populations uh, as well, uh, growing more in terms of percentage, that's also a key issue with regard to demographics. The condition of the transportation system. Okay, we have built our interstate highway system from the 50s and 60s. A lot of that now has to be replaced. It's re going to require a lot of dollars. Um, as we replace it, is there, are there options to be able to take a look at sensors and other types of monitoring mechanisms that we can incorporate uh, into that rehabilitation and reconstruction uh, process? Uh, evolving economic markets. Uh, transportation is a key ingredient to economic health. Uh, I like to tell my students it is the foundation of society as we know it. Uh, my structures in water people don't like that when I say it, but I, I honestly believe that transportation today at least is still fundamental to having strong economic growth. Uh, and we're seeing in the United States, for example, an evolution from a metropolitan level type of economy to what we now call mega region economies that, that go beyond just simple metropolitan areas but go into multiple states. And that's happening worldwide, has significant implications with regard to how we provide transportation services, transportation infrastructure, as well as the types of information that goes along with those types of services. Technology clearly is going to be a huge influence in the future, and I'm going to spend most of my, in fact, all of my talk talking about that, so I won't talk about it at this point in time. Energy supply and price, uh, clearly the transportation is a commodity, um, and the price of fuel, the price of oil is going to have a strong influence in terms of what people do in terms of the modes of transportation that they choose. Uh, in the supply field, uh, you probably are old enough to have gone through some of the, the reductions in supplies and what that has meant in terms of the disruption to the transportation system as well as the dis disruption to the economy. Our ability to finance, cr a critical issue, and I'll come back to that later on uh, in the area of pricing. Uh, what I call environmental imperatives. Um, if you look at transportation over the past 50, 60 years or so, it's really been an evolution of getting more and more concerned about environmental impacts of both the construction of transportation facilities as well as the operations of transportation facilities. Climate change is now a big issue with regard to us, and I've done a fair amount of work on that, and I'll come back to that issue uh, later on as well as in terms of possible research areas. And then finally, the ability of our institutions to really be able to, to build, monitor, manage, operate our transportation systems. Very different when you're building an interstate system versus how you manage an interstate system and what types of tools and techniques and capabilities that you have. So this really is the context. If, so if we're talking about sustainability and transportation in particular, we need to understand many of these things as being parts of the characteristics, if you will, of the future uh, for transportation. 
Now, let me turn quickly to sustainability, how transportation views sustainability. And I'm not going to get into, I know we said we're not going to get into arguments about sustainability. We're not. Uh, we accept all the traditional definitions. But what's interesting, I think, to this group is how we, as transportation folks, take a look at what are some of the strategies, what are some of the things that we are thinking about to make our transportation systems more sustainable. Uh, this is from the Council of Ministers of Transport from the European Union. They define a sustainable urban trans transportation system uh, as allowing basic access and development needs for individuals, companies, and society, making sure that it's affordable, operates fairly and efficiently, and then also limits emissions and waste and environmental. If you will, the three cornerstones of sustainability, economic development, equity and environmental. Okay, so those three, the triple bottom line issue incorporated into what we're looking at. Not to be outdone, the Oregon Department of Transportation says, hey, look, this is what we think a sustainable transportation system really is trying to do. Uh, and so you see them arguing that it's really reinforcing livable and economically strong communities, mode choice, choosing different options of, in terms of transport, uh, transportation, efficient land uses, uh, distribu distributing benefits from the system and, and equitably bur the burdens across society be affordable. Safety is a huge issue with regard to transportation and has a lot to do with vehicle technology and IT applications of, in terms of how one looks at that particular issue. So we define safety as part of sustainability uh, with regard to quality of life issues. Reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, other pollutants, clean fuel efficient vehicles, maintenance, etc. So, so the Oregon DOT, arguably one of the more advanced DOTs in thinking about sustainability, has defined what they think uh, are really the types of things that we need to think about in terms of sustainability and transportation. You aren't the only one thinking about the relationship between IT, transportation, um, and sustainability. This is a coalition in Europe um, from industry, government, academia, and others. Uh, they have what they call the Science Innovation Business Council, uh, and you'll notice who they're bringing together. Surprise, surprise, computer science, geographic information science, intelligent transportation systems, computer graphics, cognitive science, politicians. Yeah, they have to be there. Freight and logistics companies, et cetera. And they are arguing in the context of transportation, the challenges have to do in sustainability, safety, emissions, you know, vehicle standards, network standards, fuel dependency, network congestion, smart vehicles, fleet and freight management. They also had another group, which I'll, you'll see in a minute why I put this one up, called Future Cities, um, where they also brought a series of professional and, uh, professions and uh, uh, disciplines together including many that were in the transportation, but including civil engineers, architects, et cetera. And their challenges had a lot to do with some of the things I talked about earlier on, which is changing demographics, uh, looking at geosensor networks, urban mobility, what about city planning, how about the uncertain information distribution among travelers and vehicles, and how do we get that to be more efficient and more ubiquitous, uh, information regarding how you transfer from one mode to the other, those things that, that we would assume are done very efficiently and in reality are not. Okay. Now the Meyer framework, and that's this Meyer framework, okay? Uh, two years ago, the Dutch a group, uh, universities and government agencies, research agencies, asked me to go and give a keynote speech in Amsterdam on sustainable mobility. Now, why the Dutch, who arguably, I think, are at the leading edge, at least in transportation sustainability, are asking somebody from Georgia, of all places. I forgot this is being filmed. Georgia is a great place. Geor Georgia, of all places, to talk to them about sustainability, uh, you know, I was somewhat surprised. Free trip to Amsterdam. I'm there, though. Okay, so I put together this. I was thinking about what does do, what, what do we really, we, we, the United States, really mean when we talk about sustainability and transportation. Um, and in very simple terms, I said, well, first of all, it has to do with how we design our vehicles, the types of materials that we use, and the types of fuels that we use for those particular vehicles. It has to do with how we influence travel behavior, how people choose between different modes. Uh, do they substitute modes with information technologies, for example, information, and pricing? Um, it's how we manage our systems and how we look at performance of our networks and how those networks are used and, and being more efficient, if you will, and more effective with regard to those networks. Importantly, the relationship between transportation and the provision of transportation and how urban areas, urban metropolitan areas, we call it urban form, that linkage is critical. And over the long term, what we do in transportation with regard to making it easier to use or faster to use or safer to use or where we actually provide services has a lot to do with how our cities develop. And there's a really important sustainability linkage, if you will, there between that particular relationship. Clearly, the environmental issues, how we deal with energy, how we deal with climate change, air emissions, et cetera, very, very important in the context of sustainability. And then, you know, in the bottom line as an engineer is how do we actually design our infrastructure? We call it green design now along with green everything else. 
um, as it relates to operations and safety. And then the point that I made there was that really uh, it's a, an integration of all of those things from a systems perspective if you're really trying to adopt a national or a state or a regional type of policy. Now, I'm going to use this particular framework to focus on several areas that I think we need, are possible areas of research uh, with regard to the IT, transportation, and sustainability relationship. Um, some of them are easier to talk about than others because, as was mentioned earlier, there are some areas like what we call intelligent transportation systems where a fair amount of work has been done. We're nowhere near there by any means whatsoever, uh, but the radical, you know, transformative type of research really will be building off of stuff that we're already doing, whereas in other areas in this framework, we're not really there, and there are some, I think, giant leaps that can, in fact, be made. Let me start with what I consider to be the easier one, which is the system network operations management under dynamic conditions, if you will, the ITS uh, type of activities. Um, and I just want to make sure you're aware, and I'm sure many of you are, there has been a fair amount of effort since 1991 uh, when the federal law was passed that said there shall be something called IVHS, Intelligent Vehicle Highway Systems, and then the transit people got upset and said, well, that's really cars. Okay, now we're at Intelligent Transportation Systems. Um, and this is the smart mobility for a 21st century America, kind of a blueprint, if you will, with regard to the types of things that we should be doing in the area of intelligent transportation systems, the use of information, the use of information technologies for vehicle control as well as uh, routing and network optimization types of things. And they've identified five major areas uh, that they think are reasonable goals uh, with regard to this so-called smart network, uh, making transportation systems more efficient, uh, providing more options for people to use where, in fact, uh, those options are maybe available. Uh, providing travelers a better, more accurate, and more connected information. That is really one of the key elements of the entire ITS program. Making pricing and payments more convenient and efficient, and I'll come back to that issue in a minute because I do think that's one of the critical elements here. And then in the area of environmental sensitivity, try to reduce the amount of trip making anyway to reduce congestion and, and all the, the negative impacts associated with that type of thing. Now this to me is the key issue though in this particular area, and this comes right out of that particular report. Um, you know, while ITS has actually begun to see some significant benefits in terms of efficiency as well as reductions in environmental uh, impacts, um, many of these solutions or applications have really been done in a segmented way. Um, they have not been integrated in any way. You know, what you do in the highways, well, the transit systems are completely separate. Uh, how you connect airports with regard to the highways from an information system, yes, we're starting to get there, but we're really not there. So my argument is that in this area where there has been some footsteps taken, there is a lot more that can be taken fundamentally to provide a completely com uh, integrated systems perspective with regard to transportation, what we call mo multimodal tra transportation systems. Um, this is a framework that comes from the Federal Highway Administration. They call it the, the harmonization framework, which kind of shows you the different elements and components uh, that are associated with possible technologies and information and communications technologies. Uh, you'll see four different areas, the travelers, the centers, the concept of where information is brought together, um, vehicles, and then as well as what they call the field. Um, and each one of those boxes, and more importantly, the arrows between those boxes, I think is really there's still huge opportunities to make major advancements in terms of the types of technologies that are used for either vehicle control, vehicle operations, or network control, network operations, information to the travelers, et cetera. And I don't have time to go through all of these, but, but the concept up above is that, in fact, there is some entity, a transit agency or a highway agency or a traffic control agency of some sort, that's bringing in this information and managing or controlling the operation of the system. Uh, I am quite familiar with many of these traffic management centers and the lack of sophistication of these things are amazing uh, with regard to the surveillance cameras, video cameras sometimes that do work and don't work and there are the pictures on the screens and, and human uh, interpretation, oh my goodness, a car just stopped there, now we need to do something, push a button and the button doesn't work and, and all sorts of good stuff. So there's a high level, in fact, other systems around the world put us to shame uh, with regard to how we are doing that upper right hand box uh, with regard to the centers and how we collect this information. Um, so this framework, again, is kind of where we are today, uh, but my argument is going to be that there are, in fact, some real opportunities. So what I want to do now is to go through that framework, starting with this one, and talk about some possible ideas, uh, some not transformative in terms of research, but I think would really still have huge impacts to lay the groundwork, if you will, for additional work in the future. Um, 
Number one, um, there's an incredible amount of data, uh, what I would call real-time data being collected from the users of the transportation system now, um, and yet more that can be collected. The, we are overwhelmed with data, even though we're not doing a very good job of collecting information, er, uh, data on everything, we are overwhelmed with data. Uh, and, and we being the researchers, we being the managers of the transportation system, how do we use this data? How do we data mine this data? How do we, how do we get a handle on this, types of, of this, of this data that, that really makes sense in terms of the types of decisions that we as controllers or managers of the system uh, can find useful? Um, the issue of flexible scheduling. Okay, we've kind of dipped our toe in the water on this one uh, because we have surveillance and saying, aha, there's congestion on this route. Let's get information out to people so that they can make decisions of how to avoid things, uh, things like goods movement, freight movement, uh, emergency response fleets. Um, and that's done today to some extent, but it seems to me that one of the real, for example, one of the real applications is to, is to extend that. For example, most of our surveillance systems are, are, are on interstate highways. We have no surveillance systems on what are called major arterial roads, which are the next roads down in terms of importance. And we have certainly no surveillance on local, what we call collectors and distributor roads. So we focus on interstates, rightfully so, because they carry a lot of volume, but th it's not ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous by any means. Once a fire truck or a tow truck or an ambulance gets off the interstate, good luck. Um, and so it seems to me that one of the real applications with regard to interesting uh, extensions, if you will, of this is to try to make these types of systems more, more ubiquitous. That vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle data issue is we're just starting to get into that particular issue. We, if you look at the evolution of transportation that we've done 40 years ago, we did our challenge was how do we monitor the network? Um, about 20 years or so, it says, well, now how do we monitor vehicles going through that network as a, manage, a control, command and control type of system? Now it's, well, gee, can the vehicle communicate with other vehicles to let people know what's going on and information that can be used? So that's where we, where we are, really are now. Um, and where I think we're heading possibly is, in fact, now monitoring the individuals with all the privacy implications associated with that. Um, so I think there's going to be a much wider application of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle data exchange for everything from trying to avoid crashes, which I know we're doing today, but also routing through the network, especially off of the interstate highway system where we really don't have that capability. Obviously, the wireless technologies have been fundamental to what we're doing now with regard to our handheld materials and saying, yes, the bus is going to show up at a certain time. We can use these things now to try to set up ride-sharing programs. So I think that wireless technology as individual trip aids, um, aiding people making decisions with regard to how they want to navigate a particular network is going to become really very important in the future. Um, I mentioned this issue of... Um, uh, we have kind of silos with regard to who's in control of what in the data. A multimodal systems perspective really begs the question of how do we manage those databases? What types of operational practices do we put in place? What are the standards integration of getting all this data from all sorts of sources, both public and private, and make some sense out of this with regard to management of the system? Uh, Multi-source database development, and that means sources from multiple modes, from different environments, combining environmental information in terms of sensors, uh, in, uh, in a, a comprehensive strategy with regard to what's going on, and this comes from the ITS strategic plan, it's not mine, really makes sense. We don't do that at all today. Uh, and it's something that I think will give us a better handle in the future of taking a look at how do we develop our transportation systems and operate our transportation systems in the most energy efficient, most environmentally successful way that we have. Um, Number three is, is really, I think, an important one. Uh, we always have problems getting information from truckers, from rail companies, from anything to do with private because that's proprietary. Um, and yet they have a, a wealth of information in terms of what's going on in the transportation system um, that I think is a real challenge with regard to how could we use that information combined with the types of information that we collect or data that we collect to provide some very useful information for, for users. And then this human information interface. And in other words, how do you comprehend the data that's being collected? How do you put this data together so people understand? I have been in government uh, in, back in the day, you know, where we didn't have the sophistication that we have today. And I would produce all sorts of wonderful information for, you know, great graphs and things else. And people wouldn't didn't have a clue what I was talking about. And so the visualization, the, the ability to take this information that you're getting, data that you're getting, and, and turning it into information that people can look at makes some sense. One of my colleagues at Georgia Tech came up with this many years ago, um, and he calls it the traffic temperature. Similar to weather temperature, here's the traffic temperature of the highway system, freeway system in, in Atlanta. And he was 
contemplating the issue of saying maybe pre using this to predict what's going to happen next day, the next day, the next day, based on monitoring, absence any incidents, which of course are uncertain, but basically you could have a whole system of people saying, well, here's the traffic temperature today, temperature is high, temperature is low, what do we do with it? Um, I figured by this point in time, either you were asleep or you're not, so I decided to wake you up. The beer supply chain, okay? Um, this, is a, this is from a recent report from the American Association of Tra uh, State Highway and Transportation Officials, which kind of follows where, how beer is made and how it goes through the supply chain. And the only point of me putting this up there is to say that each one of those boxes, from, from the farming to the air freight to the customs clearance to the brewing to the component com manufacturer, et cetera, has a transportation component to it, and you can really be able to manage this supply chain from a transportation perspective with more advanced uh, technologies and information flow. Part of this, hmm? No pipes, that's right. Well, I'll put some pipes in the future. But, um, also part of this bigger category is I would call it the resilient network and smart assets. Um, we have been talking about smart transportation for a long time. It's really dumb transportation with some increments in smartness. Okay, and we're, uh, the, in the future, you're going to see more and more of these, the sensors being applied to different assets to have real-time sensing of changing external conditions and assets as a materials response. I suggested several years ago as part of a study I did for the Transportation Research Board that in the area of climate change that we could have sensors that would in fact sense what's going on and that the built bridge itself could change uh, with regard to uh, higher temperatures than normal or whatever the case is, water levels higher than normal. People thought I was out of my mind. Uh, but, but I think we're going to be getting to there at some point in time with nanotechnology, et cetera. Uh, Real-time monitoring of capacity availability. Okay, we now know you go, you go to downtown some places that says, well, there's 200 spaces available, there's 100 spaces available. That's, that's nice. But if I had known that before I left, I probably would have gone another direction. Okay? So this concept of, of monitoring the capacity of the transportation system and providing that in terms of a dynamic routing through the, through the network, I think, has real opportunity. Uh, more sophisticated levels of technology deployed in vehicles uh, to be able to provide a more centralized response in terms of how you manage the system. But in the future, given the technologies that we have available to us in terms of handheld technologies, maybe this whole idea of command and control is going to be all passed down to the user. Um, I don't care what the traffic management center says in Atlanta. It just says on my, my iPod or whatever it says, uh-oh, you should go this way, that way, and do this, and you make the decision. That, is, is, I think, is where we're heading anyway. Uh, and so this concept, this massive investment we're spending on centralized command and control systems may be worthless, at least in the, in the long term. Uh, and then long term, uh, large scale simulation models to, to, to estimate most cost effective environmentally sound response to disruptions. Uh, and I'll come back to that issue uh, in a minute with regard to modeling. I didn't want to use the word big brother because that has Orwellian kind of concepts to it, but, but I I'll use the term little brother, um, which perhaps is not Orwellian. Uh, a lot of what I'm talking about has, pr we've talked about already, has privacy issues, security issues. My big challenge in Massachusetts many years ago, believe it or not, is what we were, we were uh, taking pictures of license plates. Uh, and then we were matching the license plates to the, the motor vehicle registry database to see who, well, I mean, that's, that's, you know, fun, uh, that's simple, okay? You wouldn't believe what I had to go through as director of transportation planning because people were outraged that I was monitoring in fact, I know that one divorce case actually happened because the person who actually was seen on the, was supposed to be out of town, uh, and he was not out of town. So there, that caused problems. Uh, but, but, but the bottom line was that if, if you have problems with taking pictures of license plates, just imagine uh, the difficulties that people, some people are going to have with regard to monitoring where I am and what I'm doing. And yet the technologies are going to be able, available to do that. Um, in the freight side, clearly security is an issue. Container movements, other sites of things, agricultural security as it relates to transportation. So I think large-scale comprehensive monitoring scanning of the transportation system users, both freight and passengers, is here and will continue to be here. And I think it's going to be even more of a challenge in the future and how we do that in a non-invasive way and perhaps with a great concern for privacy is a real issue I think we need to deal with. Um, the tracking of movements to the supply chain, I, I did that with the beer supply chain. Perhaps more integrated and comprehensive monitoring of transportation employees. Um, this is an interesting invasive type of concept. Uh, you know, safety in terms of the drivers of buses and the drivers of trucks, these things are huge. People say, well, they make sure that they're not tired, make sure that they're not inebriated, whatever the case is. Well, I could envision a day when, in fact, we have, I know we've got the technology now, but actually applying this technology to make sure that somebody is capable of driving those types of vehicles or that they have, in fact, passed certain required thresholds to be part of the transportation system. 
Um, the global database integration protocols for sharing data and monitoring movements from origin to destination from China all the way to here. Again, I know we have some of that, but much more expansion, much more application. And then real-time vehicle monitoring for compliance, and I say, yeah, right. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, if you're speeding, okay, the vehicle control system will say you're speeding, and that information will be submitted, okay? Or if you went through a red light, and I know we've got red light running now, um, all of this would be automated and it would be information. Well, if you think you've got problems with license plates, uh, just imagine if someone goes over 60 miles an hour, you automatically get a ticket. You know, 95% of the country would be up in arms. So, so, but the technology will be there, and if the law is a law, then I can make an argument. Well, fine, if you're breaking the law, you should be penalized for it. Uh, but that element of it in terms of enforcing, if you will, what we consider to be good behavior on transportation is an area that I think is, is, a, is an important one to think about. Complex systems modeling, um, we do a lot of modeling. Uh, I grew up in the era where we did network modeling, very simplistic assumptions in terms of traffic flows. We're now evolving into and have for the last 10 years or so more simulation-based modeling for systems uh, where we are now simulating, if you will, individual trip, trip makers through the system. Um, and I do think that there's a real need for a larger scale simulations uh, of both system conditions under what I call dynamic stresses, including every potential user of the system, which is whether it's goods movement, freight, uh, freight movement, or passengers. How do you simulate that? How do you get a better understanding of that? And how do you then look at the changes in the environment, for example? Um, which is the second bullet. Uh, interactions between the transportation system and, and external east to transportation factors, things like emissions, energy, land use, and I'll come back to that on environmental. Uh, integrated multimodal modeling, uh, this, I said, this kind of reflects what I said before, is that we tend to be very good at highways, we tend to be very good at transport, never the twain shall meet. Um, but how do you simulate a truly multimodal complex system uh, where you have multiple options, you have multiple modes that you can choose from, uh, very uh, and particularly that last phrase, to minimize environmental harm, which is a sustainability element to it, which is you make routes uh, through your system that reduce energy consumption or reduce greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Uh, new knowledge um, and, and fundamental understandings of, the, of what we call emergent relationships, things like climate change, <coughs> excuse me, and I'll come back to that. And then visualization techniques, again, in terms of getting, making sure that people understand what it is that we're talking about uh, with regard to um, materials. Okay, let me quickly turn to the user side and some of the activities there. Um, it seems to me that, again, we have these personal travel aids um, uh, that we can use, uh, we use today, and then the evolution of these things are going to be very dramatic uh, and, and very important in the context of how we make decisions. <coughs> and I don't think the transportation people at least have really thought about what that means in terms of uh, how we design our systems and operate our systems. The monitoring of people movement instead of vehicle movement, I said, you know, that's certainly capable, we're doing it now, but what are the privacy issues there, and, and wh what type of information do we get from that? Um, more rapid and accurate information on changing system conditions and inducing travel response, uh, including not making the trip at all, okay, so we already look at a picture on an internet, um, or we have a picture on our, on our, our, our iPod, um, and it says, okay, it's red, or it's green. Red means not good. Uh, but doesn't give you that much information, um, and I would suggest to you that there's going to be certainly a lot more rapid and a lot more accurate information provided in terms of what's happening in the transportation system and could induce social behavior like ride sharing and other types of things. Uh, optimizing tra uh, personal travel schedules and patterns based on system performance information, and then customizing information. I was interested in the question earlier about the privacy issue. Maybe some people would like it and some people would not like it. Well, it seems to me that we have some very important market segments in the future of this country um, that we may be thinking about, uh, we should be thinking about in the context of IT and sustainability and transportation, such as the older people. Um, look at this data. Um, I, I think it's really dramatic. Um, 2007, there were 31 million licensed drivers aged 65 or older in the United States. Um, it's the fastest growing segment of our population, 65 and older. Um, and by 2030, 25% of all the licensed drivers in the United States will be 65 years or older. And now that has significant implications, um, not only in terms of the types of services we provide if people don't want to drive, but if they do want to drive, how do we make sure that they drive safely? I have a 90-year-old mother and a 90-year-old father, uh, and they live in Wisconsin, and every time they say they went to the store, I, I just cringe. Um, and you know, my father's already confused with regard to getting through ro uh, roundabouts, you know, a new concept called roundabouts. He got an accident because uh, the first time he came to it, he couldn't figure out what it was. So I think we have some significant challenges with certain market groups that I believe information technologies and information are really going to be able to help as we become an older, uh, older population. Pricing, absolutely. The, the uh, bill talked about pricing in terms of utilities. 
This is the new frontier in transportation. Economists have been talking about pricing for a long time, making more efficient use of the utilization of, of infrastructure. No one paid attention to them. People won Nobel Prizes on this, fantastic. No one paid attention to them. Suddenly we ran out of money. We can't build anything anymore. Well, what are we gonna do? Well, let's price it. And we can use that money to then to build and operate. So now in transportation, pricing is the thing, okay? This, by the way, is not sophisticated. This is the, this is the brute force method. Put monitor sensors over a lane, and if you have a, a, a card or a smart card, it'll indicate you went on there. That's not the future, okay? But the question does become, what is the future in terms of pricing? And using that information to manage people's utilization of infrastructure such as freeways or transit systems. How is, can that information be used um, in terms of making decisions with regard to how we then manage those systems? Um, how do people behave? How will people change? We actually, there's an example in California where they're changing this every five to seven minutes, they're changing the price of the road based on how congested the road is, okay? Very interesting concept uh, and something that will start to be applied elsewhere. So dynamic pricing as it relates to the dynamic control and operation of the, of the facility, new to us, probably not new to you, but new to us, and, and we're just taking baby steps and that to me really is a fundamentally important issue with regard to our particular uh, field. <clears throat> the whole issue of urban form, urban design, transportation relationship, um, I call it the connected city. We cannot talk about transportation without talking about the context. And I know there are rural areas, and I, I, I understand that. But by far the largest percent of our population lives in urban areas. And so I'm going to focus on cities primarily. And I call it the connected city, okay? Uh, which is that certainly going to be a lot more ubiquitous information available on all sorts of activities that are occurring in a city. Um, and the different types of trip-making possibilities that may exist. How do you get that information? How do you collect the data on those activities? How do you get that information into the system? Um, how can it be used? Um, how do you look at a whole city rather than just transportation or just utilities or just whatever? How does it come together from a systems perspective? I call the total trip perspective. Um, you know, we, we often look at just what happens, <coughs> excuse me, on a freeway or on a transit line. We don't really know what, what happened in the morning and what happened in the afternoon at the origin and at the destination. We are now getting to a point where we are going to be able to have a lot of information with regard to origin to destination uh, trips, um, and that will clearly affect changes in that, will clearly affect how people make those decisions in terms of timing, paths, the modes, and clearly an obvious need for sensors uh, and how we exchange information and data with regard to those, what the sensors do. Standards, protocols, hierarchical structures for different data sources in a connected city. Um, possibly the IT and information as a substitute for movement. Um, I'm not so sure on that. Um, I leave others, social scientists, to figure this one out. You know, telemarketing or, or telecommuting was supposed to be the big thing uh, way back when, when you and I were younger. Um, and we, this was going to substitute for transportation. And we saw exactly the opposite, <laughs> is that people stayed, there were more trips being made than less when people telecommuted. Um, and so it's interesting from a sociological perspective of this so-called substitution effect, and I think there's some very interesting research that could be done there. Um, and then I think in, in the long terms, and especially bringing in the social sciences, what does a connected city really look like? How is it different than what we have, to, what we have today, and how would people live in such a city? Um, energy, climate, the so-called environmental imperatives, um, I call it environmental stewardship. Um, different types of, of protocols, uh, real-time information that takes a look at how do we operate our systems to, in fact, not to reduce congestion per se, but to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or to reduce energy consumption. And this is already being done, but really the Im implication here is the extension to this to much broader application. Now, in the long run, this may, may not be an issue because if, in fact, we're changing our vehicle fleet to alternative fuels, then by definition, you know, greenhouse gases presumably would be reduced, although it takes many, many, many years, if not decades, to turn over a fleet, um, a, a national fleet, for example. So this, in the long term, this may not be something interesting, uh, but, in, but and the, by the way, just because we have alternative fuels doesn't mean we get rid of congestion or the need for infrastructure. Um, so there are serious implications with regard to that. I think it's very important with the area of environmental sensors and how you look at that and feed that information back into the infrastructure aspect biodiversity metrics in terms of what's happening to the local environmental conditions and real-time monitoring and the modeling the linkage between the changing environment and transportation infrastructure. Now, I wish, I guess Tim is not here because I was going to say I had no offense intended. I've done a lot of work recently on climate change and transportation. I'm an engineer, okay? I have dealt over decades with a lot of different disciplines. The most difficult people, <laughs> climate scientists, okay? They're up here, okay? 
I'm an engineer. I'm down here. Uh, and so their models are interesting and they're you know, wonderful things. That's great. The temperature is going to change and average whatever. The rainfall is going to go. Tell me in the state of Georgia. Well, I can't do that. Okay, but if I, I as an engineer and I am supposed to be advising the Georgia Department of Transportation what they should be thinking about in terms of design standards for bridges that will be in existence for the next 125 years, you just can't tell me, oh, it's going to change this way in the nation. And so it's been very interesting the disconnect between the, the modeling that's done, very complex, sophisticated, and I appreciate what's being done, and how we as engineers use this information, and that it's called downscaling. And, and that, to me, is if in the climate area, is a huge, huge issue. And, and the potential research there, I think, is phenomenal with regard to helping us as engineers, not scientists, but engineers, figure out what do we do about it. Um, and so I throw that out there. I wish Tim were here to hear that because he may have a counteraction. But uh, anyway, so let me end with this. I, I borrowed this from a, uh, a report. Um, uh, and I thought it was a very useful um, statement. Uh, because it really talks about the role of, of IT and information that's being produced and what does it really mean with regard to sustainability. Uh, and, it, 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 and I'll just read it. It facilitates the integration and participation of those three parts of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental protection. And or, and I think this is the key phrase, contributes to the strengthening of the process in which society is transformed according to the ideals of sustainable development. So not only does it provide kind of the foundation for doing certain things, it allows you, it enables you to do things, it allows you to do things that you may be doing otherwise, um, that you can do it more efficiently, you could be doing it faster, perhaps you may be doing it uh, uh, in, a, in a more effective way uh, than under ordinary circumstances. So with that, let me end, um, and I guess take any questions that you may have for transportation. Thank you. As I told Bill, we went from the smart grid to the dumb grid, which was transportation to the dumb grid. So, yes, sir. Hello, I'm uh, Neil Martinez from, from the Pacific Eco Informatics and Computational Ecology Lab. And one of the things that these talks bring up is to what degree does IT application sustainability push NSF from perhaps more basic research towards more applied research, uh, say engineering, and, and I'm, I'd love to hear what people think about that. I, I don't know if, you, if you've been involved in that effort long enough to be able to spec, uh, speculate on that. And then the other point I just wanted to make is that we, so echoing something several people have said, the importance of social science yeah. and yeah. it being sort of the poor stepchild of NSF. And I guess 20, 25 years ago, when Earth system science got announced, they said, we're going to get atmospheric scientists to talk to oceanogra oceanographers. And it's like, okay, great. It, what about the humans? Well, that had to wait maybe yeah. 10 or 15 years. So along the lines of that reasoning, I'm wondering how much are you suggesting perhaps the NSF portfolio move more heavily into social sciences to address the issues you mentioned? Well, um, um, <laughs> if it's a zero-sum game, I'm sure I'll get killed if I say more going that way because it takes it from someplace else. But, but my, my entire research uh, profession really has been with dealing with social scientists. I mean, I, again, you can't in transportation do what you do in transportation without dealing with people who deal with cities and people who deal with people and that type of stuff. People, what is travel behavior and what do people, how do they make those decisions? Um, so at least in my field, uh, I would say that social science in the context of transportation, sustainability, and IT is absolutely critical. And I, I think if you don't deal with that issue, you're, you're missing a huge part of what the problem is or the challenges are with regard to transportation, at least, and I suspect utilities and other areas as well. With regard to basic versus applied, um, um, I'm all for basic, okay? I mean, I have, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher, so I understand the need for basic research. Uh, but I'm also an engineer, um, and, and I'm in the dirt, okay? You know, I love to do basic things, but I also every now and I like to, to build something and look, take my children and say, I did that, okay? So that's what engineers love to do. Um, if you don't get at the application level, um, great thoughts will go nowhere. Um, and so I, I you know, I, I'm not going to suggest take 25% of your resources and, you know, put it there, but, but you have to have, and I think this climate science is a classic example, um, and maybe we're, maybe we're too soon, and maybe the engineers are at the table too soon to be able to say, well, let's wait for them to figure out how to do the downscaling issues to say what this really means. Maybe we are, I don't know. Um, but that's what people are concerned about. I mean, the people in the state departments of transportation and the transit agencies and the federal highway agencies, 
that are looking at this and, well, what does this mean to us? So tell us, explain to us, give us tools, give us techniques. And the answer is, well, we're not, you know, we're up here. Um, and so how you bring these, the theoretical and the basic research into the tools and the methods and the approaches and the design standards and the protocols uh, that we as op applying type of people do, I think is critical. Um, you know, what we did when I was in Massachusetts and what we've been able to get the Georgia Department of Transportation to do is that, you know, they don't apply basic, they don't fund basic research in state DOTs. But I have a gentleman's agreement with them, which is, you know, we'll do applied research if you give us 20% of the money to allow us to do the bigger picture theory type of thing. And, and they've, they've agreed to that because they understand the relationship and the linkage between the two. Most state DOTs would just kick you out of their office. Okay, well, if, you, if, if we don't have that, we have to rely on places like the National Science Foundation to do some of the basic of theory re research. Or research. But, but I think there's a disconnect. If, if, in fact, the theory and the basic research is being done up here, and a lot of the applied stuff is being done down here, unless people know what's going on, we have a real significant problem. So I, I guess what I would argue is that there needs to be a, 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 a consideration, a strong consideration for the applied aspect of some of these theoretical, con theoretical concepts that you're talking about and basic research. I don't know if I said what you wanted me to say, but <laughs> I am hearing this theme about social science. I guess, uh, yeah, yeah. I imagine. Wow, I struggled with it for 30 years. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Pierre Demier from the University of Arizona. Uh, with the advent of the electric cars, for instance, in the future, what the transport station system is going to do is interact with the power grid. Yes. Are you considering these type of interactions? Ab yes, absolutely. Um, and in fact, there have been some interesting studies done at UC Davis and, and, and other places that have looked issue uh, specifically at that particular issue is once you go to an electric, all electric uh, vehicle system, what are, the, what are the power demands with regard to, um, you know, for the, on the electric system? When do you power up the vehicles? What's the most optimal strategy? What does that mean in terms of the power stations, the whole infrastructure that has to be put in place for recharging and all sorts of stuff? There's been some very interesting studies done on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think I'm done. Thank you.